Hello, middle school students. This is our last week of distance learning. Um, I hope you guys had a great time listening to these videos and that you learned a lot. I know I did. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about government in Arizona and how that came to be. Um, first things first, we're going to talk about um, some of the explorers and how they contributed to government. Do you like to explore? Do you ever daydream about adventures where you hike off into the wilderness and discover strange animals or new people? Do you sometimes wish you could fly like an eagle over the earth and then head for outer space? Imagine what your town looked like before it had any buildings or people. What do you think Arizona looked like 140 years ago? It must have been exciting for the government explorers who took the job to explore the West. Back then, there were places in Arizona that no American had ever seen before. Arizona must have seemed strange and mysterious to these new people. Who were these explorers and why did they come to Arizona? They were explorers paid by the government. Remember, Arizona was not part of the United States then. Some explorers were like spies sent to new lands to decide if the land was worth buying or fighting for. Some were soldiers sent to protect new colonies or to fight foreign soldiers for land that the U.S. government wanted. Sometimes they were scientists paid by the government to learn more about the land. It was important to know how much rain falls in an area, what kinds of plants and animals live there, and what kinds of natural resources like water and minerals could be found there. Some explorers were sent to make maps of new lands so that people who came later would know which way to go. Most explorers were strong and brave men and women looking for adventure. If you're ready for some adventure too, let's get going. All right, so let's talk about some of the changes to the Grand Canyon. Have you ever visited the Grand Canyon? Now is a great time to go. I personally have never been to the Grand Canyon, but hope to go one day. Modern features and improved services are always becoming available to make your experience more enjoyable than ever at the Grand Canyon. The shuttle bus that takes people around the canyon's rim now includes a staging area, allowing space for four buses so passengers don't have to wait a long time for a ride down. Hikers can more peacefully enjoy the breathtaking views from Mather Point thanks to the removal of a parking lot and roads there. These are being replaced with landscape vegetation. Stairs and guardrails have been restored, making it safer for walking. The path between the main visitor center and the rim will soon feature a stone landmark feature as a meeting place. East of the Overlook will be a new amphitheater. An amphitheater is an outdoor location for performances and concerts. All these changes and more help to make a trip to visit our park even better. The Grand Canyon area became a national monument in 1908. It's also one of the seven wonders of the world. Because the area is a national park, no dams can be built along the Colorado River there. Dams can disturb the river's ecosystem, preventing buildup of sandbars, which are needed for fish, other wildlife, and even campsites. So let's talk about some of the government explorers. Lewis and Clark, those names should be very familiar to you. Although they didn't come through Arizona, the first government explorers in the West were Meriwether Lewis and William Clark in 1804. Lewis was a friend of Thomas Jefferson, the president of the United States, our third president. Lewis and Clark explored and mapped the land in the Northwest all the way to the Pacific Ocean. These explorers were brave men who fought back stories that made other, many other people want to explore this area. It wasn't long before others were following in their footsteps. After Lewis and Clark's journey, many Americans wanted to move out West. The United States wanted to own all the land from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. In 1846, the United States went to war with Mexico for the Californian territory. President Polk sent Colonel Stephen Kearney to lead the Army of the West. They fought several battles that helped win the war. Kearney became known as the father of the U.S. Cavalry. In addition to being a great soldier, Kearney was also a great statesman, a strong political leader. Kearney wrote rules called the Kearney Code to make sure people were treated fairly. Some of his rules later became laws and are still laws today. The Mormon Battalion, a Mormon unit of the U.S. Army, 
came to Arizona not long after the Army of the West. These soldiers came from the large group of Mormon pioneers who were trying to get away from persecution. Persecution is terrible treatment suffered because of one's race, religion, or political belief. They marched almost 2,500 miles in one year. This group is very important in the history of the West. They built the first good wagon road all the way from Santa Fe to California. Some of the men also helped build Sutter's Mill in California. They hoped to earn enough money to go back to their families in church. In 1848, they found some shiny yellow rocks in the stream. The shiny rocks were gold. People from all over the world rushed to the West in search of the American dream. The train huffed and squealed as it came to a stop near the Green River in Wyoming. A one-armed man got off the train in the middle of nowhere. Three boats and nine of his friends got off the train. Two. The boats were made for a very long and dangerous journey. The man was John Wesley Powell, and this was the beginning of his expedition. As the group traveled, they drew maps of the land and wrote about the people in the area. Months later, only six men and two boats had survived the journey. They had lost four men, one boat, and most of their supplies in the Colorado River. Powell loved the beauty of the Grand Canyon. He wrote this in his journal one day. We are three quarters of a mile in the depths of the earth, and the great river shrinks into insignificance as it dashes its angry waves against the walls and cliffs that rise to the world above. The waves are but puny ripples, and we but dwarfs running up and down the sands or lost among the boulders. Powell also said that the colors of the heavens are rivaled by the colors of the rocks. Powell saw the power of the Colorado River. Somehow, he knew that one day, people would use the river to bring water to the desert. And we still use the Colorado River to get our water here in Arizona and California. Let's talk about camels. Did you know that there's camels in Arizona? I didn't know that. Did you know that camels traveled right through the middle of Arizona? In 1857, they were led by Lieutenant Edward Beale of the US Army. Can you imagine a camel train crossing through Arizona on the way to California, that would be a strange sight. In 1856, the army bought two shiploads of camels from Egypt. They hoped camels would work as well in, Air in American deserts as they did in the Middle East. The project ended during the Civil War and most camels were lost or sold. 50 years later though, wild camels were still seen occasionally in the desert. Hmm, very interesting. All right, so now we're going to talk about Graham County in Arizona. It is in the southeast of Arizona. Graham County is a friendly place that was first settled in 1872 by Mormon pioneers. For many years, it was mainly an agricultural area. Cotton and livestock are still important to the county's economy. Travel and tourism is also an important industry in Graham County. Winter visitors are attracted to the area by its mild climate. People also enjoy different kinds of natural recreational activities, which include hiking, swimming, fishing, hunting, and rock hunting. Two well-known citizens were born in Graham County, Melvin Jones, the founder of the Lions Club, and Spencer Kimball, who was once president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormon Church. All right, let's talk about the Ocelot. We um, studied the ocelot when we talked about South American culture, so this should be very familiar to you. Ocelots live in Arizona, Texas, and New Mexico, but they are rare and hard to find. They're more common in Mexico than the United States. They look a lot like a small jaguar, but their spots are elongated like stripes. These nocturnal cats live in woodland areas, rainforests, mountain forests, thick brush, desert, and scrubland. Their diet consists of small mammals, snakes, fish, small deer, and birds, which they mostly hunt at night. They weigh up to 35 pounds and get as long as four feet, including the tail. Ocelots are endangered because people have hunted them for their fur and because their habitats have been nearly destroyed. They have fur that ranges in color from reddish yellow to smoky purple, and they have a pink nose. And they're really adorable. All right, so that is going to be it for this lesson. 
um, you're going to scroll down again and you're going to click on the link for the quiz and you're going to answer the questions. You can email me back your answers or you can show me your answers on our Zoom meeting Wednesday morning at 9.30, okay? Remember, please check in with Mr. O and the choir project that you guys are doing. You should all be participating in that. If you don't know what it is, um, check your email or your parents' email. Um, it's a really fun um, opportunity to be in our virtual choir with Mr. Olmsted. So um, you have one more assignment towards the end of the week. If you do both um, video assignments, you'll be entered to win a $25 gift card. So make sure you do that. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Bye.